children in uh, preschool through fourth grade. They are going back now for junior church, so you're more than welcome to send them. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 17 today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to go there. If you don't have your Bibles, shame on you. Bring your Bible to church. And if you don't have a Bible, we want to get one in your hands. So uh, stop by the Welcome Center. We don't have a whole lot of extras out there, but um, ask, ask the Welcome Center about getting one. They'll jot your, jot your name down, and we want to have one in your hands. So that being said, many New Year's resolutions and goals are uh, fitness-related. And uh, people want to work out more, they want to eat better, they want to lose weight. Anybody ever, not necessarily this year, but have you ever made one of those New Year's resolutions? Okay. I don't believe some of you are answering and being honest. Um, Experts, whoever they are, they say that those three things, eating better and uh, exercising more and losing weight, make up about 30% of all resolutions, but uh, you know the drill, right? January 2nd rolls around, and uh, you realize that ain't nobody got time for that, right? Things, things in life are still hectic, and they're still busy, and there's not enough time to, to focus on the things that you want to get done, um, but there's some positive and surprising news. Uh, most gyms say that New Year's resolutions regarding fitness actually stick around longer than you and I would probably assume that they do. Uh, Most gyms show like a steady increase in gym goers all the way up through uh, the beginning of April, which probably tells us that tax time is more depressing than January 2nd. Can I get an amen? Amen. How about some lights? Can we get some lights on out here so people can read along in their Bibles? That would be wonderful. So today we are kicking off this uh, new series called Get Fit. And uh, we're going to be in this series for six weeks, still going through Core 52, jumping around to different chapters. And this week, we started with chapter 42 called Radical Change. Raise your hand if you read chapter 42. Yeah, that's good stuff, okay? And so I hope you've been interacting with that. If you you have kids at home, I really hope you bring them in in that. Uh, There are some videos that you can find at core52.org, all kinds of resources. We just want you to be in the Word this year. So the habit we're looking at today is radical change. This is the, the kind of New Year's habit that won't just find you successful for one year. This is kind of a life lifetime change kind of thing that we're talking about today. And Matthew chapter 17 is a great place to pick up on this idea. Matthew 17 verses 1 through 20, that was day 3 of uh, Core 52 this week. Who read Matthew chapter 17 verses 1 through 20? Nice, nice. Good job. So this is what it says. After six days, this is verse 1, after six days Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Now, reading the Bible in context is always an important thing. And what we see right off the bat is there's this, there's this idea of a, a time stamp, right? Before what happens in Matthew 17, we find out that six days prior, there must have been some sort of big event. Which leads me to asking, what significant event happened six days before this, Okay. And we can kind of backtrack through the Gospels, and we find out that six days before Matthew 17, Jesus is having this really important conversation with his apostles about Jesus' identity. And uh, you you may have read this before. It's a very well-known couple verses from Matthew 16. Uh, Jesus is asking his apostles, you know, what, what does the general public think about me? Who do they say that I am? And so his apostles are answering and giving him some different options. And then Jesus looks at them and he says, but what about you? What about you guys? Who do, who do you say I am? And then we have Simon Peter's favorite answer or famous answer. Read that line with me. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. If you've been immersed into Jesus or you've been uh, put on the salvation of Christ, that's probably something that you've stated before. Anybody, raise your hand if you've said that in a public setting, or maybe somebody's asked you to repeat that. And that's one of these steps that we consider someone going through to receive salvation. It's this idea of confession, that we confess with our mouth that we believe that Jesus really is who he says he is. 
And so Peter gives this famous response, and six days later, we find ourselves in Matthew 17. After six days, so after Peter's made this big confession, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Raise your hand if you've ever been transfigured. A couple of you are cheaters. You want to know why? Because you were in first service. Uh, there's a good chance all of you have been transfigured. And it might not quite look like Jesus' transfiguration. I, the, suddenly, Jesus' appearance changes, and his face lights up, and his clothes are bright white like, like fireworks on the 4th of July. Right? This is a huge huge moment. But this, this word transfiguration, it's adopted from this Greek word metamorpho. Okay, I want you to say that with me. You got a hiccup in the middle of those two O's. Metamorpho. And that probably looks like a word that you're familiar with, doesn't it? The idea of metamorphosis. And it's this idea that something, one thing becomes something else. Like there's this level of maturity, a movement, or a progression. It's like a caterpillar winding itself up in a cocoon and it becomes a butterfly, or a tadpole becomes a, or a maggot becomes a. So all you maggots out there, you've been transfigured. Right, you've, you've matured from one thing to the next. It's like when a boy is able to grow a beard or a woman too. I, I don't, yeah, there's some transfiguration that happens in old age, and it's okay. It's okay to admit it, right? And so it's this idea that, that this thing comes to some completion. And so this is Jesus' transfiguration. This is his metamorphosis. This is when the disciples get it. They see Jesus, these three, Peter, James, and John, and he's, he's metamorphed, he's transfigured, and his appearance looks different, and they know then that there's something special, there's something different about Jesus. We've all experienced some transfiguration in life, changes that we've gone through. And, and so this is a big moment in Jesus' ministry. And some say this is the pinnacle of his ministry between his birth and his resurrection. This is a big, big moment. And these three apostles, Peter, James, and John, are there to witness this. And so this sign of maturity, this transfiguration, what we need to know about it is that when change is embraced, when we say, yes, I know I'm going to change and I'm cool with that, then what happens is transformation becomes possible. The only way we can ever radically change, the only way we can adapt and adopt new things in our lives that make a good, solid, positive difference is saying, I'm good with that. And I know a lot of us as human beings, we don't like change. It's hard to embrace it. But Jesus says you've got, you've got to embrace that idea. If you want to be transfigured, if you want to be transformed into the person that I've created you to be. And the cool thing is, is that Jesus invites us into his transfiguration. Look what 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18 says. It says, and we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Now, just read those blue words with me. It says, and we reflect the Lord's glory. Pause. How cool is that? When we allow God to transform and change our lives, we share, we reflect his glory to other people. And then keep reading. So, and we reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness. God picks us up where we're at. He meets us where we are, just as I am. And he begins changing us from the inside out. And then Romans 12, too, it's all up in the same exact idea. Close your eyes. Do not be conformed to this world, say it out loud with me, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So this idea of transformation, it just weaves its way through all of what God calls us to go through. Matthew 17 verse 3 says this, Just then... So, okay, they've gone up on this mountain. Jesus is, 
uh, is experienced this transfiguration. Peter, James, and John are watching. And as this happens, just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. So if you wish, I will put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. What in the world is going on here? As if seeing Jesus transfigured wasn't enough, God now allows Peter, James, and John to see this really random appearance from two Old Testament guys, Moses and Elijah. Out of all of the Old Testament Bible heroes, why these two? Why does God provide the, these, these guys at this specific moment? Well, Moses, he represents the law of God. If you remember in Old Testament times, right, God spoke to Moses. Moses handed down the law to all of the Israelites. And so in a nutshell, Moses represents all of what God wanted his people to know as far as the Old Covenant was concerned. And then you had this guy, Elijah, one of the coolest, if not the coolest, of all Old Testament heroes, this great prophet represents all of the prophets and the hope for what God would do for his people in the future. And so since these two guys show up at Jesus' transfiguration, basically what we're supposed to understand then is that Jesus represents this complete picture. Right? That Jesus is superior, that he is the fulfillment of the past and the hope for the future. And so Peter is sitting there and he's experiencing this. And he's like, man, I would love to just bottle this up. Let me ask you, have you ever had one of those like spiritually high moments in life right, where things are clicking? Right? You're, you're following Jesus well. You're being faithful. You're, you're being obedient to him. Not only that, but work is going well. Your finances are in order. If you're married, maybe your marriage is, is happy and healthy. And if you have kids, maybe you're raising them well and they're being obedient. And things are just clicking. You ever have times like that in your life? And you feel like, man, I wish things like could, could stay like this forever. Raise your hand if you've ever been through a moment like that or a time frame. What happens as soon as you get a little proud of yourself? It all comes what? Crashing down in a real quick hurry. It's just life. It stinks sometimes. And here's, here's the point that I'm trying to make with this. Peter is like, man, I wish I could, I wish I could bottle up this moment. Jesus, this is so good. right? Can I, can I just build these three shelters and you can hang out here and Moses can hang out here and Elijah can stay in this shelter and I'll just sit and chill in this spiritually high moment. And just when Peter thinks that would be a perfect idea. Look who talks. While he was still speaking, this is verse 5, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, will you, if you have your Bibles, will you read this line with me in your best God voice? <laughs> here, it, here it goes. This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Some of you guys, guys got to work on your God voice, okay? I don't know what God sounds like, but I'm guessing it's, it's bold and it's loud and it has to be deep. And so Peter's thinking, I would love to bottle up this spiritual high moment. And just when he thinks and suggests that, God speaks. And it's as if to say, uh, Peter, no, you can't, you can't do that. Because this isn't how life works. Verse 6, when the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. So when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. And just like that, this moment, this magnificent moment of Jesus' transfiguration and the appearance of Moses and Elijah, it's over. So after this, Jesus and the three apostles make their way down the mountain. If you read that, this this week, you know what happens next. As soon as they get down off the mountain, they're immediately met with trouble. Look at verse 14 in Matthew chapter 17. We read this. When they came to the crowd, in other words, when they came down from the mountain, they met a crowd. A man approached Jesus and knelt before him. And he says, Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures and he's suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. And so Matthew explains this poor boy. We don't know anything about him and, and we don't really know what his diagnosis is. 
But for all intents and purposes, it looks like he has a severe case of epilepsy, right? He has seizures. He can't control himself. Mark and Luke, they add some other details. They say he foams at the mouth. He, his body becomes rigid or limp, and he, can't, he, he has no control over any of his bodily functions. And, and this, this boy's dad brings him to Jesus and says, I think you could heal him. I gave him to your apostles to heal, but they, they couldn't do it. And this is what Jesus says. This is verse 17. Oh, unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. So they come down from this spiritual high moment off the mountain, and they're immediately met by quarrelsome, faithless, and helpless people. Isn't that just like your life? When things are rolling then a, flip, a switch is flipped, and things aren't going well anymore. And so this, this is where they're at. They're in real life. Jesus and his apostles, we, all, we often look at them and they say, and we think, if they only knew what it was like to live in my world, if they only knew what it was like to experience real life, and this is the proof that they did. From this spiritual high moment comes this extremely low valley. And I think the reason we get to see that here is that God is showing us that that is right where we belong. You see, the church is allowed to infiltrate the world because we know what the world is like. We live in it. We experience it. We, we have to deal with the same junk that everybody else has to deal with. And God has placed the church, God has placed us right in the midst of all that chaos because it is us who can show the world that radical change is actually possible if. And we'll get to that if here in just a moment. I want to talk a little bit about this boy's situation. Um, we look at this as a disease. Whatever's going on with this boy, he has seizures, he foams at the mouth, he loses control of his body. And, and from a worldly perspective, we look at that and, and we want to know, well, what, what was wrong with the boy? But Jesus jumps beyond all of, uh, all of what that boy is experiencing, and he says, the boy is demon-possessed. Now, I want to be quite clear. Not every illness constitutes demon possession. Okay, so, like, you don't get a cold, and immediately you're possessed with a demon. That's not how it works. Though the influenza feels like it, that is also probably not a demon, okay? But... Throughout the New Testament, we see several times that demon possession shows up in the form of what appears to be an illness. And Jesus heals this boy. Look at verse 18, I think it is. Yeah, Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed from that moment. Now, what I think we can probably gather from that is this. Radical change is interwoven in all parts of our lives. I have physical healing, spiritual healing, emotional healing, mental healing. I think Jesus heals us in all various parts of our lives. And, and that doesn't mean that if we aren't healed in one way or the other, that he hasn't blessed us. But God, I believe, gets involved in all of those areas of our lives. And he's caring and he's concerning about the physical, about the mental, about the emotional, about the spiritual. And if we don't allow him to change multiple areas of our lives, then I'm not sure that change lasts forever. Mark chapter 9, I want to show you another side of this conversation. Um, Jesus is still talking with this boy's father. And Jesus asks the boy's father, how long has your son been like this? And the boy says, from childhood. In Greek, that word literally means from infancy. And so from an infant, this child has been suffering from this demon possession. And the boy's father said it has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. Look what Jesus says. If you can? If you can, everything is possible for him who believes. And immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. 
Now, Jesus' reply here can be taken a couple different ways. Jesus asks this boy's father, if you can, and, and, and we can read that two different ways. We could say, if you can? Like, in other words, Jesus is saying, what do you mean, bro? You don't think I can heal this kid, right? If you can, or it could be, if you can. And so I want to ask you this morning, which option do you think this is? Is it if you can or if you can? Right? There's two different ways you can read that. And so I'm going to give you a minute to think about it. Just mull that over in your brain. How is Jesus asking this question? And I just want to kind of poll you guys. Who thinks it's if you can? Like Jesus is saying, you don't think I can heal this boy? Who thinks that's what Jesus is saying? Who thinks it's the other option? And Jesus is saying, if you can, right? Who thinks it's that one, okay? I don't know. I honestly don't know because I wasn't there to hear how Jesus asked this question. But this boy, I don't, or this boy's father, I don't think he was questioning Jesus' ability to heal. Rather, I think Jesus is testing this man's faith. It's as if Jesus is saying, I know I'm capable of healing your son, but do you believe that I can heal your son? And then the father delivers this one-liner, this really good statement. I do believe. Jesus, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Jesus rises to fill the gaps in our faith. Have you ever noticed that in your life? When you're feeling faithless, helpless, useless, and I, God, I can't do this. That's where Jesus steps in. And when we're vulnerable, Jesus comes alongside us. He does it for this guy. He'll do it for us time and time again. Look at verse 19. Then the disciples came to Jesus. Okay, so, so Jesus has healed this boy, and they've kind of moved away from the crowd, and Jesus' disciples come to him in private, and they ask this. Why couldn't we drive that demon out? In other words, Jesus, you've given us the power to do this. Right, we've, we've cast out demons before. We've healed people before. Why, why couldn't we heal this boy? And Jesus replies this, verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith. I tell you the truth. If you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Anybody ever seen a mountain move? Raise your hand. Yeah. I don't think anybody's ever seen that. Raise your hand if this, this passage has always bothered you a little bit, thinking, wow, I must be completely faithless because I can't do that. Anybody ever feel that way? Yeah. I, I read this passage and I think, okay, let's look back in history. Has a mountain ever moved before? And the answer must be no because no one's recorded it. Truth is, God has never himself even chosen to move a mountain as far as we know. And so why does Jesus use this language? Well, the truth is... This language has been used in Scripture for a long, long time. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 4 says this, Every valley shall be raised up. Read, you, read the blue words with me. Every mountain and hill made low. The rough ground shall become level. The rugged place is a plain. Isaiah 54, 10 says this, Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on you over and over and over again. A lot of times in Isaiah, there's this idea that the mountains will be flattened, right? And God will make roads of those mountains. That's not an easy thing to do and they didn't have big machines to do that back then so what in the world does God mean when over and over and over again he says these mountains in our lives can be moved because I'm struggling to figure out how to do that in my life can I get an amen yeah the question has to be asked then what has God authorized us to do when it comes to moving a mountain what power has God given us to accomplish that task? When it comes to radical change, it's not the amount of faith we have, but rather the focus of our faith. Think about that for a second. If we have enough faith, will we ever be able to move a mountain physically? I would venture to say no, not a physical one. But if the focus of our faith is in God, then he gets involved overcoming the impossible things in our lives. 
God can move the barriers that keep us from forgiving other people. God can break our hearts in a way that changes the way we think. God can correct the patterns of our lives when we focus our faith on his ability, not our own. So the question then becomes, how? How does God do that? How do we live our lives in a way that allows God to move the mountains in our lives? Well, the answer is found in verse 21. You guys want to look there? Matthew 17, verse 21. Raise your hand if you have that verse. You guys got good Bibles then. It's like, you wait, no, it's, it's not there. Verse 20 is there. It says this, because you have so little faith, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. And then there's no verse 21. It skips straight to verse 22. What in the world is that all about? At the, Bible, at the bottom of your Bible on that page, you probably have a footnote that includes verse 21. And at the beginning of that footnote, it probably says something like this. Some manuscripts say, in other words, the, the oldest manuscripts of the Bible don't include these next words, but some of the later ones do. And that has to make you ask yourself, well, can this be reliable? Can we trust later manuscripts rather than older ones? I don't know. Sometimes I just don't know. But if verse 21 is included, this is what Jesus says next. But this kind, in other words, the demon that possessed this little boy, this kind does not go out except by what? Prayer and fasting. You see, I don't think we fail to change because we're unfamiliar with how to do so. And I don't think Jesus is saying that you have to pray out that demon. You have to pray out that problem. You have to pray the mountain away. I don't think that's what Jesus is saying. I think what he's saying is you have to pray to focus your faith on God because he is the only one capable of removing that mountain. A wise person, I don't know if she was wise or not, just some random cool lady said this once. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always gotten. Heard that before? I think that's kind of the same idea. You know, if we always tackle problems on our own, if we always try to move the mountains in our lives on our own power and our own accord, we're going to fail time and time and time again. It might work for a little while, but it that change, that radical change, it doesn't last. And so what do we need to do differently? What needs to change so that we experience transformation? You see, I think there's a hint at the very beginning of Matthew 17. Look back in your Bibles. Matthew 17, verse 1, reads this way. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. Isn't that the most earth-shattering verse you've ever read? You guys feel really spiritual right now, don't you? If I talk quieter like this, you, just, you feel it. What's so special about that verse? Not a whole lot of anything, it, it appears. This talks about these three guys decide, because Jesus chooses them, that they're going to go with him up this mountain. It's very simple, and it's very subtle, but what we need to see is that Jesus has this group of guys, Peter, James, and John. We don't know why he chooses these three. We're not even going to pretend to guess why he chooses these three, but he does. And we know these three guys as his inner circle. They're his closest group of friends. They follow him. They listen to him. They don't always get it, but they are paying attention, they, and they are improving but I think what's important is that we don't miss the connection here. And that is this. God designed us to be with other people. We need people even when and if we don't feel like we need them. Fellowship is more than just hanging out with the people that you enjoy being around. 
Fellowship is more than just sitting down at a table and eating a meal with someone. As this week's Core 52 video pointed out, if you watched it, small groups are where radical change happens. And sometimes it happens easily. Sometimes we naturally click with people and, and things seem to be rolling. But it always and only happens if we intentionally set out to allow ourselves to be in uh, close proximity to other, other people, other believers, and be vulnerable enough to open up and share what's going on in our lives. And that is where I think God meets us and them I think that's where God gets involved, and, and while worshiping together on Sunday mornings is good for inspiration, small groups are great for transformation. It doesn't happen overnight, it doesn't happen the next day, it doesn't happen by accident, but Jim Rowan said this, your life does not get better by chance, it gets better by change. Will you pray with me? God? We know there are parts of our lives that need to change. We would be ignorant and we would be lying if we said the opposite. And God, oftentimes we attempt to tackle those changes that are needed on our own and by our own power. And over and over and over again, we've realized that we fail. God, we know that you have the power to move mountains and to flatten hills and all that stuff in our lives. We know that if our faith is focused on you, that, that some of those issues in our lives will become smoother. They'll become less intrusive. They will become lesser of a deal. And so it's not the amount of faith that we have in you. It's rather the amount of focus that we put into our faith in you, not ourselves. So God, our prayer today is, is that you will continue to get involved in our lives. And we know that you want that to happen through community. We know that you've created us to be with other people, specifically other believers who can sharpen us, who can help mature us, who can help bring us along, who can help hold us accountable to the things that need to radically change in our lives. So today our prayer is that you will challenge us and convict us. That you will continue to uh, put us in the path of other believers. And that we will do the same for them. And God, we pray for uh, the dozens or the dozen or so small groups that take place within this church family. We know that iron is being sharpened in those groups. And we know that belief is being matured in those groups. And so we just pray for more of that. And today, God, I also pray that those of us who are not involved in a small group or a Sunday school class, that, that will be challenged and convicted to do so. Because while this time frame, this hour that we have on Sunday mornings, it, it might serve the purpose of inspiring us, but it doesn't serve the purpose of transforming us as you want to. And so, God, uh, challenge us, convict us. That is our continued prayer. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Will you stand with us and sing?